Good evening. My name is Clarence Reynolds. I'm the director at the Center for Black Literature at Medgar Evers College. Welcome to this evening's John Oliver Killings Reading Series program. Our JOK Reading Series programs were started in 2010 with the intentions and the purpose of having writers come to speak to the audience, to fellow readers and writers about their latest work. <clears throat> and also to celebrate the literature of writers of the African diaspora. This evening, we are delighted to have poet, essayist, and novelist Honoré Fine and Jeffers join us for this evening's program. Professor Jeffers will be in conversation with Dr. Brenda Green, the executive director and founder of the Center for Black Literature, to discuss her debut novel, The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. During the program, Professor Jeffers will share thoughts about her writing, what inspires her, and offer some background about her captivating epic novel, her debut novel again. We also want to hear from you, the audience. So following the conversations, I will then moderate a Q&A from you. So please place your questions in the Q&A section on your screens when the time is available, the time becomes available for you. Also, before we begin, I want to thank you all for joining us again. And I also want to extend a heartfelt thanks to African American Literature Book Club, AALBC, and Troy Johnson, and the Amazon Literary Partnership for being our continuous supporter of the John Black Killings Reading Series and also the Center for Black Literature. I also want to thank the Center for Black Literature staff, Leah Bird, Amber Magruder, April Silver, Donna Hill, Simone Swa Manning, and also Kel Spencer for making all of our programs the uh, exciting, memorable uh, events that they are. And I also want to thank you all for making this evening possible. At this time, I want to welcome Dr. Brenda Green, Executive Director and Founder of the Center for Black Literature. Dr. Green is a scholar, educational leader, author, literary activist, and radio host. She is Professor of English, Founder and Executive Director of the Center for Black Literature, and Director of the National Black Writers Conference. Her education leadership, professional accomplishments, and scholarship includes essays, grants, book reviews, and presentations in African-American literature, composition, and multicultural literature. Her edited books includes The African Presence and Influence on the Cultures of the Americas, Rethinking American Literature, Resistance and Transformation, Confirmation, I'm sorry, con Conversations with Black Writers. She also teaches African-American literature and composition at Meg Evers College, and she's the host of Writers on Writing radio program, which airs on Sundays, WNYE, I'm sorry, W, <laughs> sorry, Dr. Green, the radio program at Meg Evers College. I'm so excited. I'm so excited about this, this evening's program. So without further ado, here's Dr. Brenda Green. <laughs> Thank you so much, Clarence. Um, I understand. I am so excited too. It's so nice to see Honoree. And I remember when I first met Honoree Jeffers years ago, and she was so full of energy and, and, and such a delight. She came to our previous conferences. But I want to welcome everyone here to our conversation with Honoree Jeffers, who has written a phenomenal book, 800 pages, and it is a page turner. It is um, definitely people have mentioned Toni Morrison and I have to th say that I thought about Toni Morrison too when I was reading her book. So the John Oliver Killens reading series is very dear to our heart. Um, John Oliver Killens is really at the core of the Center for Black Literature with respect to its literary journal, the Killens Journal of Arts and Letters. It's um, reading series, this is one of them. Uh, we, we also make sure that we, we pay tribute to John Alva Killens when we host our National Black Writers Conference. He had a vision to bring together writers every year to talk about the state of Black literature and to provide forums and ways for people to celebrate Black writers. And this Killens reading series is one of the ways that we do this. So again, we're very, very honored to have that. The Killens Reading Series is one of our programs. Of course, we have the National Black Writers Conference, which is coming up next year. It will be held March the 30th through April 2nd. And listen to this title, 
which very much aligns with uh, Honoree's book, The Beautiful Struggle, Black Writers Lighting the Way. And so we, it recognizes that we are involved in a struggle continuously, but we find ways to survive and sustain ourselves through writing literature. And again, this is something that Honoree Jeffers has done. We also have our writing workshops, our Wild Seeds Writers Retreat, which is coming up in February, our Elders Writers Workshop for elders who are writing, our youth program we're very excited about, re-envisioning our lives through literature where we bring teaching artists and writers together and have students focus on their own writing and create stories. We just have a wealth of programs. I encourage you to visit our website at www.centerforblackliterature.org. I encourage you to donate and that's how you support our programming. Most of our programming is free and open to the public. We are a public um, not-for-profit agency that brings together writers and that is doing so because that's part of our mission. The Center for Black Literature, our mis mission is to support Black writers and to ensure that the public knows about the, the literature produced by Black writers and the complexity of that literature. Um, so we also are very excited that we're celebrating our 20th year Next um, October, we will be 20 years in existence. So I tell, ask you to stay tuned for that. But right now, I just want to again welcome you. I want to thank our team. Clarence has mentioned our um, Center for Black Literature team, uh, which includes Clarence Reynolds, the director, our project, co project um, coordinator, uh, Amber Magruder, our marketing director, April Silver, our Associate Program Director, Leah Bird, and of course, our Virtual Events Manager, Simone Wow. So thank you, and we're gonna get started. So look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you, Dr. Green. I also wanted to say a big shout out to April Silver of Akila Work Songs for uh, for being our uh, marketing and core communications director. She's, she's a huge asset to the Center for Black Literature and we truly appreciate having her. I also wanna thank Dr. Jess Kane, the uh, vice president of uh, Megar Evers College who's joining us this evening. And I also would like to give a thank you to Ann Bush and the community council of Megar Evers, the community council for Megar Evers College. Also Mr. Richard Jones, who's on the advisory board for the Center for Black Literature and Margie Cook of the Brooklyn Public Library. I want to thank you all for helping to promote this event this evening. It is now my pleasure to introduce Honoré Fannin Jeffers, the featured guest for this evening's program. Honoré Fannin, Fannin Jeffers is a fiction writer, poet, and essayist. essayist. She is the author of five poetry collections, including the 2020 collection, The Age of Phyllis, which won the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work in Poetry and was long listed for the National Book Award for Poetry and the Penn Volcker Award. She was a contributor to The Fire This Time, A New Generation Speaks About Race, edited by Jasmine Ward. And she's been published in the Kenyan Review, Iowa Review, and other literary publications. Jeffers was elected to the American Antiquarian, Antiquarian Society, whose members include 14 US presidents, and she is critic at large for the Kenyan Review. She teaches creative writing and literature at University of Oklahoma. And she's also the Paul and Carol Dobbs Sutton Chair in English at the University of Oklahoma. Honore, it's our absolute pleasure to have you with us. Thank, Thank you so much you so for joining us. I am now gonna begin the pro I'll turn the program over to you and Dr. Brenda Green. All right. Thank you again. Thank you again, Clarence, and welcome, Honoree. It's such a pleasure to be in this conversation with you, and you look beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Green. It's just so wonderful to see you. I think the last time we saw each other was two years ago, three years ago at AWP, and That's it's right. always just such a pleasure to see you. You are always such a blessing every time I see you. Well, thank you. And congratulations on this phenomenal book on your first day. You're an award-winning writer, but you have outdone yourself. Thank you. I did my best. Voice. 
So um, we like to begin. You you cover so many themes in this book. Definitely. You know, um, colorism, race relations, the exploitation, the occupation of the land. You go. You cover so many centuries. You really. Um, are giving such a complicated story, a complex story. So I'd like to start by just asking you to share um, briefly for our audience, uh, to give a brief synopsis, if you can do that, of the story, of this novel. Well, The Love Songs of W.B. Du Bois is a coming of age story of one African-American girl, Ailey Pearl Garfield, as she moves from childhood to adulthood. Uh, simultaneously, while she's on this journey, she reconciles her journey with the journey of her ancestors from the 18th century uh, to the 20th century. And um, the story is really a metaphor for me for America. Uh, you mentioned the great Toni Morrison. Of course, I do not have her gifts, um, but she's someone that is still a touchstone to me in addition to uh, my mentor, uh, the great poet Lucille Clifton. And one thing that um, Professor Morrison always talked about was that the Black experience is not marginalized. It is America. That's and right. I, as an Afro-Indigenous person, I'm um, African-American, and so I, I present and I was reared in Black communities, but I also always want to um, give the glory to my Indigenous ancestors as well. And so I wanted to write a story Again, you know, when Professor Morrison says she wanted, wanted to write a, a, a book that she had never read, I wanted to read a book that I had never read uh, that, you know, centered both the indigenous as well as the African um, ancestral story, even as it's a thoroughly black book. And so that's what Love Songs is about. Okay, so thank you. So why don't you take this opportunity to share an excerpt from Love Songs and then we will continue our conversation. All righty. Okay, so you know I'm getting old, so I'm gonna switch out my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading glasses, my ugly glasses. And um, I'm going to read from um, a song I should have have this marked, bless my heart, um, from the, from the uh, sort of first third of the book. And, um, and it's about um, the ancestor who we know about her African journey. And so I'm just gonna read this first page and a half since it probably will take about three to five minutes because as you know, I have a deep Southern accent. <laughs> really, so. I had not noticed that. <laughs> so this is um, called The Loss of Africa. We know of those taken from the place called Africa, captured by men who had transgressed against flesh for a long time. The Africans who stole others and kept those folks for themselves. The Africans who stole others and sold those to the Europeans who would take them over the water and humiliate and sometimes torture them for life. We know about the dark, dark folks who would never see home again. We know dates. We know hours, we know disbelief, we know mourning. We know about the years even before 1619 and the years that would come after. We know about those Africans who arrived in a place that the English called Jamestown, Virginia. We know which villages these Africans lived in before they were stolen, their collection of conical huddled homes. 
domestic birds running on the ground of a courtyard, feathers of black and white, red, a goat tied to the side of a hut. And every morning, a mother rising from her pallet, tossing grains in a pestle. And we try not to weep over what was lost to those folks. We know about an enemy from a neighboring village. We know of strangers who saw wealth in meat rocking bone. The names of the captives are lost to everyone but us, their tribes, their children, if they had them, their beloveds they'd hope to marry in ceremonies of laughter and wine. The rivers passing through their nations, their words for a rooster, cock crowing, for a delectable fruit, skin the color of red intruding yellow, for their warbles and ticks of joy. On that English ship that would land in Jamestown, the enslaved probably weren't locked in irons. That time would come later, after the sailors saw the Africans look at water and sing, leap overboard and the sharks swim to meet them. These 20 and odd folks would begin as bloody vectors, spilling lines across continents. More Africans enslaved by the English would arrive on ship. You already know that we know laws as well. We know 1662 and the words set down in the Virginia colony, partis sequitur ventrum, Latin for that which is brought forth from the belly. And so African, now Negro, women's children would no longer follow the status of their fathers as had been English common law for centuries. With dark children, their mothers would decide their fate. If a woman was enslaved, her children would be enslaved. If a woman was free, her children would be free. And if enslaved somehow, a mother would try to hold on to her child to keep that child from being sold. And if separated, her child would forever grieve. This is what happened to a girl named Kine, a girl from across the water a girl whose line would become tangled with our people who lived here on the Western side of that ocean. Wow, powerful, powerful. And, and it speaks to, I'm, I'm glad you chose that selection because when I look at how you structured this book, the songs end up being reflections of the past. And yeah. then you use W.E.B. Du Bois to carry the story forward. And so can you talk a little bit about why you chose that structure? And then related to that, yeah. how your poetic voice, which is what we heard, it, it felt like you're reading poetry, influenced the way you structured the novel. Well, I have to say I'm a little choked up. I'm sorry, Dr. Green. I really did put my makeup on carefully and all of that. But sometimes when, you know, when I think about those times, yes. it's very painful. Um, well, I've, I've spoken about this before. Originally, the novel was just supposed to be Ailey's story. Right. And people laugh at me now, but I was really only supposed to be writing a beach read. Yes, I've heard that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so what had happened was I was uh, writing Chickasetta stories. I've always been in Chickasetta, okay? Which is a fictionalized version of Eatonton, Georgia. My mother's people are from Eatonton and Milledgeville. My mother taught Alice Walker. So it's a very small you know, little bitty town, everybody knows everybody, everybody's in everybody's business. And so I began writing these fictitious stories about this place that I, I only remembered Eatonton as a little girl. And so I didn't want to get in trouble with messing up the landmarks or whatever. So I, I made up this town. So anyway, I, Ailey was one of the people, but then 
Um, probably about two years in, I began having dreams. And when I would awaken, these, these, these long lyrical passages would come to me. And, and in the dreams, I would see people. And I, I knew they were ancestors. I try to say they were Ailey's ancestors, but to this day, I'm not sure whether they were mine or Ailey's, but I would, they would speak to me and I would wake up and I would write these long passages that didn't really seem connected at the time to Ailey, an Ailey story there, which was a coming of age story. And, but they just wouldn't let go. And they would, they would feel me it's really funny. It's hard for me to speak about this in non-Black settings <laughs> because, you know, you, you feel a little, sometimes a little silly, but, you know, we, we're visioning people. Um, my, my mentor, Lucille Clifton, was a visioning woman. And so I would, I would feel this, this, this frisson in my flesh. And, 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 it, and it just felt like, like God speaking to me, but in a physical way. And so I just kept writing, you know, down in these notebooks. And, and then probably about a year or 18 months in, I realized this was connected to Ailey's story. And that's when I got very discouraged because the two voices were so different and I just didn't know um, what I was going to do. But because I was also writing The Age of Phyllis about Phyllis Wheatley Peters, this is what we call her now, because I started that whole, you know, and so now people call her Phyllis Wheatley Peters. It was, I was able to sort of think about the framework. I'm always thinking of the ancestors. That's my charge. I don't think everyone has to have that charge, but that's my charge. So, so just, just to follow up. So when you, when you decided that you were going back and forth because it is, you know, everything um, runs in cycles, yes, what made you decide or how did you decide to use the whole concept of song to to go to tell that to, for that poetic voice and then when you got to early to just use the structure how did you go about deciding when to use songs versus the 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 other voices the the, the story of early because and, and just to add to that as i was reading it i kept saying this it feels like and this is before i heard you talk about it feels like these, these stories, some of them are so self-contained. They could be short stories. And I know that you you thought about writing. You talked I, about I, short stories. They, they almost can be self-sustained, but you connect them by yes. this really interesting structure. Well, one of the things, and, and, and I remember reading something in Poets and Writers where uh, a man, I, 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 I keep saying, I wish I you know, cause it's a, it would be a good essay to teach from, but he talked about a story is a song and a novel is a symphony. And so while some of these things are self-contained, I was very, very clear that I did not want this to be connected short story. And right. so I wanted to make sure that there was a sweeping kind of, uh, uh, structure to it. But in terms of how did I know, you know, the songs, it's, I'm a blues poet. I've always, I've been a blues poet since the very beginning. And this is a blues novel. And so when I began to think about the movements of the blues, which I wrote about, you know, in, in, I think it's the first blues theory where there's like a, a blues print you know, very, very structured. And there are three movements to the blues, identification, exploration, resolution, or reconciliation. The other thing about the blues is there's a dipping between 
the major and minor chords. And so you can have humor in the blues to sort of offset the tragedy that's always sort of hovering, you know, when we consider the origin of the blues, right? And you know, I'm from the deep South. And so I, I, it, there, it wasn't going to be possible to have that sort of irreverent, sometimes profane voice in the songs. I, because, you know, because I do work on the ancestors, I knew that there had to be reverence right? Even as we were dealing with a lot of these sort of terrible moments. And, and so with Ailey's story, she, even though there's, you know, there's some really sad places in Ailey's story, there's a lot of humor in, in Ailey's voice. And, you know, there's cussing because it's young folks. I mean, I grew up at the beginning of the hip hop moment, and so, you know, so when I thought about Ailey, who's only a few years younger than me, I was born in 1967, Ailey was born in 1973. I thought about what would kids who grew up with hip hop, how in the South, in the dirty South, as you know, as, as we call it, how would those kids talk? And so that's why the voices are different. And then when you go to her mother's uh, section, her voice is shaped by a civil rights right. voice, a second reconstruction voice. And then when you go to another section, I want to spoil something, then there's a whole, there's a, a vibe. So one of the things that I wanted to do is show people how the South changes but there are still things in the South that remain for Black people. Right. So you, you talk about, you, you, you keep bringing back the ancestors and memory. So memory, as you said, is a very, very important component in this, uh, in this novel going all the way back, as you said, to the 18th century. So how does, talk a little bit more about how memory carries forth the novel how memory can Really good questions, Dr. Green. <laughs> um, one of the things that people will notice when we move through the book, when, you know, is that the same incidents are remembered differently by different characters. And one of the reasons that I did that is because this is realistic in a family. There'll be people where you know, they all remember this one moment that everybody was sitting around a table at Thanksgiving. And one person is like, such as that, such as that happened. And another person will be like, no, 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 no. And then the elder will say, no, that's not how it happened. And you know, in the deep South, you can't ever tell an elder their line. That is, that is, no. that, that is a sin. No. You, you just, you'll say, well, I didn't remember it that way. And that's as close as you can get. So I wanted to show how memory changes. I also wanted to think about what, the, and I remember talking to you about this because you were there. It was 2017 when I read an excerpt, an early excerpt um, from, the, from the first song. Right. And I wanted, what does the land remember? Yes, that, that's, very, that, that's very prominent, the land. Yeah. The, what does the land remember? How we were, I was, I was, it was chilling reading those excerpts about what, what was done to the land. And the, yes, the, land, the land has been violated in the same yes. way that the people have yes. been violated. And I thought about that because there was a, a, a moment years ago, um, my mama and I were driving, um, to Millersville, see my uncle Alvesta. This is when my uncle Alvesta uh, was, um, you know, dying from cancer. And no, that was with Aunt Tweet. See how memory changes. But we were someplace, and I said, "Mama, where did where did y'all grow up?" Because she had never showed me. Because they had set my grandma down in town. 
So they had a little house. They've sold the house now, but they had a little house for grandma and everything. But they grew up out in the country, right? Down the road from Driscoll's, who were cousins from the great uh, uh, artist, David Driscoll. He, okay. was born in, he was born in Eatonton. And Driscoll is actually a well-known Cherokee last name out here. So, so I chose that last name on purpose. So we're driving through and mama couldn't find the landmark. And she got very upset. And my mother is not someone who cries. You know, it's easy for her to show anger, but not to show grief. And I was sort of internally kicking myself. Like, why did you do this? You know, um, but the whole landscape had changed. And she was trying to point out Beaver Dam and she was trying to, and, and, and I began to think about what does the land remember? Because the land remains, even as the indigenous people were forced by the settler uh, colonialists from that place, they still, there's something inside of them that remembers. And then there are those of us who are Afro-Indigenous you know, who hid out. And then there are some people who are Anglo indigenous who hid out. Um, so that's what I thought about. And some people have talked about, oh, these are slave narratives. No, they're not slave narratives. It's, it's, it's a chorus. It's not a Greek chorus. Yes, it's it a, is a chorus. It's an indigenous chorus that speaks and sees everything. And one of the reasons I chose that framework is I wanted a witness that saw everything. And I, I love knew- that analogy because you, when you said the chorus, those that becomes the song and that helps to carry the, the story to keep it connected. <laughs> I, I love it, I love it. Um, you know, I know that you've probably been asked this question before but I have to say that as I read this book and I listened to some of the experiences of Ailey and the personality of Ellie, mm-hmm. someone came to mind. <laughs> so I always ask this because, and particularly, you know, your first novel yes. um, is generally somewhat autobiographical. So if you don't mind sharing, if, if, if what parts of this novel is autobiographical? Because I definitely feel like your spirit was the spirit knowing you, the spirit really came through. Well, it is fictitious. What I will say is what is autobiographical is I went to an HBCU, okay? I attended an HBCU. My mother is, I attended Talladega College, uh, graduated from Talladega College, class of 1989. My mother is a Spelmanite. My two sisters are Spelmanites. My father taught at Howard University with Toni Morrison um, and uh, several other HBCUs. So that is autobiographical. Ailey is a deep brown uh, 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 African-American girl nudging up against dark brown. I'm a deep, dark brown woman. Um, She's chubby. I'm chubby. So those are those sort of things. And, and when I think about it, when people talk about it, I was talking about this on a radio show in Atlanta. I grew up in the black bourgeoisie. And I always tell people I'm from the black bourgeoisie, but not of it. Because my mother was a very dark brown skin a woman and there was a lot of colorism. That too yes. is autobiographical, okay? Um, She wrote an essay uh, that was published in uh, The Black Scholar years ago, The Black Black Woman in the Black Middle Class, talking about the the horrible colorism that she experienced when she was at Spelman College. And I remember, you know, that sort of colorism and, and it never affected me. And I hope I'm not sounding ignorant when I say that. I think it had something to do with my hair texture and right. But, but you can't ever get away from your mom. 
And so even though people would allow me into, you know, these Black bourgeoisie circles, I'm not going anywhere where I can't bring my mother. And so I never really identified, but I learned the manners and the ways of doing, you know, you learn the sort of gestures right. and all of that. So when you see Nana, you see, you know, Nana Claire, you see these sort of gestures that I knew um, from, you know, growing up in Durham, North Carolina, but it's never second nature. Was well, second nature is the language of working class black people. I have that in my ear. I have the proverbs. I have all of that. I have the manners. You know, there's a, a reason why Ailey doesn't call any adult in the book by their first name. <laughs> yes. you know, yes. Right. So there's all of these sort of things. I wanted people to see a particular generation that is no longer, you know, like I get young black folks, we won't talk about the context, but there was a moment where someone called you Brenda and I was like, I was about to say something and I said, Honore, let it go, let it go, but I would never, right? And so there are these sort of ways that, you know, all of that is autobiographical. Okay. All of that is autobiographical, uh, yeah. Right, so so thank you for sharing that. And the other um, question that I'm, I was curious, I kept thinking about, again, Toni Morrison, um, her novel, Mercy. Mercy. <laughs> you, you do me such honor, Dr. Green. I just get <laughs> so nervous when people say that though. Right. You know, but, but, you know she, she, but she gives us another portrait of what it was like in the 17th, 18th century, when she brings the indigenous, yeah. the African yeah. and, and the whites all coming together and you yeah. do something very similar. I was reminded this could be a companion piece. You know, if you think about texts talking to each other mm -hmm. or, or as the writer, you're in conversation with other texts. So, so I, I thought about Mercy as I was reading this, that this is a text that's in conversation with that. Or could I think be it's definitely piece. in conversation yes. with it there, you know, and I kind of kicked myself because I forgot in the archiva, archival coda, I didn't mention a mercy. It's definitely in conversation. The difference is that Georgia is the late, you know, one of the very late colonies right. and this is early right right and so there's a whole right. different way of of things happening and also it's positioned it, you know it was really put in place as a buffer to keep the spaniards from you know coming coming north right so yeah right so so that's what and then of course we are now you know many of us are reading the 1619 project yeah. And of course, um, 400 souls. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of the, of the nonfiction and the fiction and how it's all coming together. And it's, it's just the way they reinforce each other. I'm, I'm, this could be a course on America because I, this I is really hope that people gain something, you know, I'm an older person now I'm in my fifties. And so, um, I did want to teach the people, but I didn't want to shove the lessons down their throat. Right. But I wanted people to be able to gain something so that they could reinforce. You know, I have a poem in the 1619 Project. Yes. Um, and so, and then, you know, my work on Phyllis Weeby Peters. So I wanted, I wanted people to be able to get something from this book so that they could understand how we got to this place. And, um, but I do think that uh, 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 as we move forward talking about slavery, uh, I want uh, 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 black folks to be able to understand that it, the indigenous experience is not separate from the black experience. When yes. you look, for example, at 
Georgia slave codes, they include the Metis and uh, Meti uh, uh, Mestizos and uh, Indians. They say Indians. So there were many moments where they, you know, they were considered together. And you can't have people nudging up against each other without, you know, if I may, folks making love, you know, folks having children together and all of that. So um, yes, I, I wanted to, I want pe people to, to know things. You know, I mentioned in the first song about black, black warriors who were Creek. You know, and I say men like Nini Wagichi and Black Factor. So I want people to really know. And I did a lot of research just for, you know, those 40, 50, 60 pages. Right. Right. So one of the things that kept coming up, a recurring theme, is, is the parallels or the tension or the conversations between Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois. Yeah. Uh, so talk about, talk, tell us about that. Um, uh, I just thought it was really interesting how that, that continued, that, that conversation continues. So that was obviously very important. And you call it, you call it the love songs of W.B. Du Bois. Well, Dr. Du Bois really loves Southern Black people. Um, you know, he comes down South twice to teach at Atlanta University. And, um, there's something about the, the ache in his work, the, the, the tension, the tenderness, the tender ache that he has when he speaks about Atlanta. It's also a source of great pain because his little baby died yes. while, you know, the first time he was in Atlanta. And, um, you know, but one of the things about uh, W.B. Du Bois is, I mean, if you go to an HBCU, you can't get away from W.B. Du Bois. You read him in a social work class, you read him in a history class, um, you read him in sociology, you read him in an English class, you know, history, everything. And so there was like a spirit that sort of hovered. And so originally though, I just had this sort of intellectual framework right. of these quotes. And um, the first draft of the novel, which was only 450 pages, was, <laughs> everybody's like, wow, um, was done uh, right around 2016. And so my agent, Sarah Burns, who's also very, very incredibly dear to me, I don't think you can be with somebody for 16 years without, you know, there being a, a real tight relationship. Um, Sarah took my novel to a lady named Liz Van Hoos. And so originally, Uncle Root just told that Du Bois story once. Right. And originally... Oh, just um, give us a little context because they don't know about Uncle Root. Okay, <laughs> Uncle Root <laughs> is basically... Um, Ailey's favorite person in the entire world besides her sister, Lydia. He's a very old man when Ailey is born. And um, he is, aside from her daddy, the only man that Ailey feels completely safe with. Yes. And Ailey is an abuse survivor, a childhood intimate yes. abuse survivor. Um, as are her sisters. And so I needed there to be a really beautiful Black man in the book. And, and when you talk about conversations between texts, Paul D is one of the most beautiful characters. If I'm getting choked up. I read Beloved. I've read Beloved seven times. Okay. I read Beloved just to get to that part where Paul D is recalling what Sixo said about the 30 mile woman, she gather me, man, right? Yes. And so I wanted to have a black man 
who 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 was just filled with love. And so Uncle Root is the person that, you know, Ailey meets him when she's three or four or five years old and he picks her up and she says, I feel safe and yes. I love him very much. I never had an Uncle Root, you know, a man like that. And so I, I created someone on the page who would love me and tend to me. And I think some black women have never had an Uncle Root either. And let's see, I'm getting choked up again. And so I wanted to have that kind of person, but he's very brilliant. He's a retired history professor at the historically black college that looms really large in the book that Ailey goes, attends, her sister attends, her parents attend. And so originally there was just supposed to be that one story, that one time where Uncle Root talks about, did I ever tell you about how I met the great yes. W.E.B. Du Bois, right? And um, that is actually, I, I remember old people when I was in the Atlanta University Center, because I transferred from what was then Clark College, is now Clark at Atlanta University, talking about they had seen Du Bois walk. They had seen him. Right. So I thought about that, about the encounter with greatness. And when you're talking about the intersections with my own life, I sometimes call my father the Negro Forrest Gump. When you Because daddy had intersections with all these famous black people. He was in the same army company with Ossie Davis. Okay. Wow. He was at Tuskegee Institute when George Washington Carver was there. And he always had this story about how he was walking down the road reading and George Washington Carver stopped him and said, don't read and walk at the same time. So there were always these, these famous black people. He was court-martialed during World War II and Thurgood Marshall was his defense attorney. Wow. So there are all these sort of, so I thought about how in black worlds, it's very small. When we get together, we'll say, who do you know? And then you just start, you know, playing that game, which Negroes do you know? And next thing you know, somebody's mama, somebody's sorority wow. sister or somebody. And so that's what I wanted to talk about, the expansiveness of African America, but also the intimacy of it. Right. So just, just following up on that. So you, but you also want to not only mention W.B. Du Bois, you go to from Booker T. Washington. Oh, right. Yes. So Booker <laughs> T. Washington, when I was growing up in, you know, when I would go down South. Now my, my daddy had nothing but contempt for Booker T. Washington because daddy had two degrees from Columbia Daddy was a mixed race person. His parents were mixed race and he grew up in the black bourgeoisie. But when I, you would go to Georgia, you would find older or middle-aged, you know, when I was a little girl, they were older to me, middle-aged black men, their names would be Booker T such and such, such and such. Yes. Right? Not even Booker, not even Tally of Pharaoh. <laughs> okay, it would just be T period. Yes, yes, right. And they looked at Booker T. Washington as a very great man. That's right. He was considered to my mother looked at him as a very great man. And so I thought about that sort of tension, right? The class tension, because this is very much, a, a believe it or not, also a novel of manners. So the class tensions between upwardly mobile Black people and working class Black people. Yes. I am one of those children. I am a child of that nexus, you know, where we, you know, my parents were intellectuals. Um, my father had two degrees from Columbia. He was very light skinned, you know, such and such. And people would treat me one way when I was with him. Right. And they would treat me another way 
when I was with my mother and, and, and that sort of tension, right? And, and what does it mean to have that sort of maternal line? So, and, and the thing is that it may seem strange to have a novel about black women primarily called the love songs of W.B. Du Bois, but quiet as it's kept, even though he chased ladies, uh, Dr. Du Bois was one of the proto-feminists. He was a feminist and he really championed black women's rights. So, you know, that 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 has something. Right. Yeah, again, the American story, the parallels yeah. and what we have in our community. And and really it was very clear about the need to look at the values of both Booker T. Washington and yeah. W. B. Du Bois that came across. In that book. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, my uh, I always think that um, what when people write, and you've, you've spoken a little bit about this, but writers very often are motivated to write because they have questions. Yes. And, and so what are some of the questions? I mean, your themes reflect around, you've, you've been talking about the colorism, the, the abuse, the um, the uh, racism, the exploitation of the land. What are the questions that you had as you were thinking about writing this book? Well, when you first began any book, you know, as, as we used to say in the seventies, you just get in where you fit in, you know, you just, the words are just coming to you and you're, you're trying to figure it out. And then after a while, the shape of it will come to you. I think I was about three quarters of the way through because, you know, you read, also when you, when you um, write a book, you read it incessantly. You go back, you read it again. That's probably why I can't read it right now because I've read this book so many times, even as a you know, when I was going through copy editing and it was done, but yes. you had to go through. I, I must have done that like maybe 10 times. But about three quarters of the way through when I stopped and I kind of moved back and I thought about what were the questions that were sort of, you know, churning within me. I started this book, I say this, when I was a nearly young woman, when I was 43. I'm now with the what the French call a, a, a woman of a certain age. <laughs> and so I know what my questions are now in ways that I didn't know then. But what I will say is about three quarters of the way through, maybe half of the way through, I thought this book is about how we got here. When I started this book, President Obama was in the White House. People were saying we were in a post-racial moment. And that didn't last long, did it? <laughs> never lasted. That was, that was somebody was smoking some real good, <laughs> uh, some real good reefer. Um, <laughs> you know, but when I finished it, we were in the belly of the beast yes. once again. And so I began to think about a book that I had started when I felt like, oh, okay, I'm writing about the past and people are gonna be sort of tired of this because you hear people say, I don't wanna hear about slavery anymore. They still want reparations. Right. They, they, they still want the money, but they don't want to hear the pain, which is in, intensely disrespectful. But I began to think about this was not a book about the past. When I finished it, it was about the, uh, about the fact that the past continues to reverberate. All right, going back to your theme of memory. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Historical memory, national memory. And so the question was, how did we get to this place? How do we get to this place as a country, as a Southern region, as a black community, as a family. And what it does is it takes this territorial kinship that we have as Americans and we and I use this one black family to sort of speak on territorial kinship as it were. 
and to really drive home that we are America. Now, we may not like America, but this is our country. We built this country along with the Native Americans. The Native Americans have fought in every war on this soil and black people have fought on, in every war on this soil. I have students that did not know that 5,000 black men had fought on the American side of the, of, of the revolution. They had no idea. And I was just shocked by that. So that was the question that I wanted that I wanted to ask. And that's when I began to give even more texture, you know, when I came back to it. And that was when I also realized it still makes me intensely uncomfortable when people talk about the scope of it, because um, yeah, in my mind, I'm great, but <laughs> But, you know, I come from country folks, though, you know, my mother's people are country folk. So it does sort of make me uncomfortable. But 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 it that was right around the time that I had to claim what I was doing. Right. The and, and also, I mean, I think you're illustrating what you did in the in the age of Phyllis and what you've done here. You cannot tell any story through yeah. literature or poetry without contextualizing it. You have to bring in the history you have to bring in the political situation. You have to bring all of that in. Yes, ma'am. But in order to really tell the story. You and do. So that becomes different. the core of the literary. And, and then as the poet, as the literary artist, as the writer, you're using those, those, those uh, elements, those poetic elements, those yeah, literary you feel so good, Dr. Green. <laughs> but you know, the thing is, Dr. Green, I knew what I was doing in the age of Phyllis. I knew, I knew, but I was at peace with it because I was telling Miss Phyllis's yes. story. Yes. And I knew I had to do right by that lady because people had not been doing right by, there had been a few people, Dr. Gates, and uh, Joanna Brooks and a couple of other people. But, you know, and then the way that they talked about her husband, which has now been completely debunked. Well, thank I, you for doing that too. Well, no, I started it, but when I mean completely debunked, there's now a white female historian who found a treasure trove of information about him yes. that shows that he was cheated out of land by, you know, people went to court and took the land, blah, 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 because that's a whole nother conversation. But what I'm saying is I knew what I was doing and, and I, would, I would pray through it. But with this book, I started off telling, you know, with a beach read. <laughs> And so, you know, and so then people are, people just laugh at me when I say, it. I laugh at myself, but, but it wasn't until around 2016 that I realized, okay, this is a serious book. This is a big book. And then I didn't want people to think I was being pretentious. This is my first novel. This isn't my second or my third but then I just had to put it in the Lord's hand, you know? And then Miss Oprah read it. That's right. Know? Yes, yes. Well, I, I'm, I'm, we're cut, getting ready for questions. And as okay. we come to that, yeah. Um, would you share with us your highlight, your highlight or highlights in writing this book and your challenges? And then we'll go over to the Q&A. Okay, I'll try to be succinct here. Mm -hmm. um, my highlights were the songs. As, as a poet, I, I can see this. <laughs> as painful as some of the places are, what I've said to people is, the more pain you have in the book, the more beauty you have to have. You, you have to have some sort of way that you comfort the reader. And also the promise that I make people now, nobody's going to see a white wedding, you know, <laughs> so there's not going to be a wedding at the end of the book. But what I do tell people is that if you come, if you come through this with me, there will be joy on the other side. Yes. And that is what I promise people. Um, so the songs were, 
they were, I felt such ecstasy when I would, when I, you know, in the dreams and then I would wake up and then I would speak to myself and I would, you know, it just, it was, it was, it was the closest I have ever felt to God writing the songs. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But the hardest part was there's a section, there's a song written from the point of view of a slave master. And those 15 pages took me like six months or something like that. And it was horrible. It was horrible. I mean, boy, howdy, the nightmares. That was the worst. That was the worst, but people needed to know. And people needed to know that this is not a fable. They needed to know that there were people who existed like this, absolute power ruins. If we have not seen that in our last presidential election, yes. we, you know, absolute power ruins. And so I needed to show people how, how he got there, not necessarily sympathy, but that happy people, happy children do not end up doing what he did. So those were the best and the worst. Okay. Well, we have, thank you. We have touched on a number of topics. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's so many more. It's such a rich book, but I'm going to turn this over to Clarence, who's going to do our Q&A. Okay. Okay. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Green, and thank you so much, Honoré. What a thank wonderful, you. rich conversation. And to all the uh, attendees and who, who joined us, I want to say, please visit aalbc.com to purchase a copy of the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, African American Literature Book Club is one of the oldest and the biggest book club by African by an African American, my buddy Troy Johnson. So please purchase a copy of Honor Ray's book, as, so, as also some of the other books that we've had featured during the National Black Writers. I'm sorry, during our John Oliver Killings reading series. I'm going to begin with a couple of questions, and they're, they're some of them. They're quite a few. The first one is from Esperanza Citron. Mm -hmm. And she asked, research can be consuming. How do you turn such research into narrative fiction? Are there particular steps or stages? Well, I wish that I had a very uh, formal way that I could tell people. But um, one of the reasons that I, I'm not a formal historian, it, uh, um, I am a scholar, but, but my scholarship is written differently. I read and 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 then I set it aside and then things start to bubble. And um, now, you know, knowing, you know, being at this place in, in not just my career, but this age and having been in the archives since 1990, um, I, no sort of, you know, what, what, what my space is, what my territory is. Black women, uh, Black women of the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st century. And so there are always these sort of notions that I'm looking at in terms of Black women and um, looking at the crossroads of um, black women's lives, the personal with the, with the um, uh, uh, public. But yeah, I don't, I don't really have a process. I just, you know, things just come to me. I write it down. I always keep a notebook. I used to keep uh, little slips of paper, but um, I started losing those little slips of paper and it would be devastating. So now I have about 40 <laughs> no books wow. that I that I have, yeah. So that you have you have things ready for your archives. <laughs> yes, but you know there are some things like I have like um my how much I owe for my light bill written in the back of <laughs> <laughs> different things like that, right? 
another question comes from an anom anonymous attendee. They say, mm -hmm. how do you keep yourself motivated or re-motivate yourself through the years it took you to complete the novel? Prayer. I am not somebody that shoves faith down people's throat, um, in particular because I'm a radical feminist, pro-LGBTQ um, uh, Christian, and I always joke and say that's like jumbo shrimp. That's an oxymoron. <laughs> but um, but I'm, I'm a very faithful person, and I give thanks to the ancestors, and I give thanks to the creator. And um, I also spend a lot of time by myself. Um, when I, when I'm with the people that I love, I'm out and about, but most of the time I, I, I spend, I'm a very solitary person and that helps me. Um, you know, I am on social media and so, you know, I'll be talking to people on social media, but there are always moments where I'm just by myself and that, I think that helps me not crowd my mind. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, because um, you can always turn off social media. Oh yeah, you can't. You can't be at dinner with somebody and say, "Okay, I'm bored with you." <laughs> Stop talking. You know, you, you can't say that, right? That's no, rude. No, but you can always turn. You know, log off Twitter, log off Instagram, put your phone down, blah blah blah. So I spend a lot of time by myself. Good. Um, an attendee named Luvon asked. Are the loves are the songs in the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois in any way related to Du Bois's sorrow songs? Of course, yes. The there's the quote that begins the novel. Um, very quickly, very quickly. Let me. I love that quote. <laughs> yes, out of the why it's why is it always so hard for me to find stuff? Here we go. They that walked in darkness sang songs in the olden days, sorrow songs, for they were weary at heart. And so before each thought that I have written in this book, I have set a phrase, a haunting echo of these weird old songs in which the soul of the black slave spoke to men. Ever since I was a child, these songs have stirred me strangely. They came out of the South unknown to me one by one. And yet at once I knew them as of me and of mine. I had that at the front of my mind for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Connie Zed asked, has your study of how did we get here change how you experienced life in America? Yes. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I used to be sort of uh, neoconservative. And so there was, you know, having grown up middle class, um, my mother's people were upwardly mobile working class people, all of them were successful. I remember when the first, you know, uh, there's always been conflict between black people and the, and the police. The police have always abused black people rather. And, but I would say, don't judge me because I'm not this way anymore. I would say, you don't fight the cops. If, you, if you're well behaved, there won't be any problems. And yeah, you know, now I'm just like, wow, what a fool I was. But those things change. I already knew about the history but it wasn't until I really began to look at it that I saw the continuum between mass incarceration, between, um, and also um, experienced things myself, which I won't go into, that I began to understand that it does not matter how well behaved you are, how pretty you are, how, you know, you wear your deodorant, how, you know, blah, 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 brush your teeth, white people aren't gonna bother you. That's just not the truth. I, I still experience racist microaggressions. Mm. Um, so yes, I changed greatly. I became even more radical. I was radical historically, but not in today's, if that makes sense, in today's world, you know, I was really scared. I'm still scared, but I also know 
there's nothing I can do about it. And so my thing is when the Lord gets ready to call me, I'll, I'll go. And so I can't be, mm. you know, terrified of white people anymore. And also um, he, she, they has taken care of me. I'm a witness to that when Oprah Winfrey called my telephone. So I just have to, you know, um, uh, tell the truth. But yes, that's how I changed. Christina Milaccio asked, sorry, if, I hope I didn't uh, botch up your name, Christina, who teaches at Medgarvis College. <laughs> did you select the audible readers who read your novel? Yes, I did. They gave me a list of people and they said I could choose two. But I wanted two different people to read the historical portions and the contemporary portions. I felt like I needed, there needed to be a deeper voice for the songs, more, you know, a little more serious. But then also when I heard Prentice on Nayemi's voice, I knew that I needed him to read all of the epigraphs, <laughs> you know, all of the Du Bois I heard uh, excerpts from the Souls of Black Folk that he did the audio book. And so I asked for three, you know, like we say, closed mouths don't get fed. And exactly. they had told me I could have two, but I asked for those three and they gave me those three. And I am just so happy. I just think it's beautiful. I have listened to the audio book. I can't, you know, read the physical book, but the audio book, it's like a movie in my mind. It's like mm -hmm. I didn't even write it. Right. Um, another anonymous attendee asked, they wrote, uh, Sankofa, you spoke about how you write from a blues lens. Mm -hmm. Have you looked into its connection with West African rhythms and you being from the South, St. Augustine, Florida, 1565, Spain and enslaved Africans from Cuba and Puerto Rico? You know why I'm smiling? There's always somebody with love and respect who tries to pull my card. Of course I have. <laughs> and you can actually Google. I have invented a poetic called the Sankofa Poetic. So, you know, I, I try not to ever talk about anything I don't know. So yes, of, of course I have. I was once married to a Senegalese man. So, <laughs> so yes. Yes, I have. I don't mean to be cranky. I just, you know. There's always somebody's like, have you heard? Da, 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 da. Yes, I have. It took me a combined 11 years on this book, 15 years on the age of Phyllis, 26 years, half my life. So. Uh, um, who was this person that asked the same question that I had one of the, um, Esperanza, again, had asked a question that I have in my head too. Why were you writing this as a beach book? Because I didn't want to write a novel. I only wanted to write short stories. That's all I ever wanted. I love stories. I love self-contained. The problem is now that all of my stories are so long that my agent can't, you know, she's like, nobody's going to want a 40 page story. Right. But you know, but Edward P. Jones writes, I love Edward P. Jones. He writes those, those, those really juicy, you know, long kind of novella, you know, like stories, but I didn't want to write a novel. And my agent kept saying, you were brilliant. You were, you know, but you're just thinking somebody saying that, you know, like when people tease you in elementary school and you come home and your mama says, they're just doing that because they're jealous because you're so pretty. So I thought that my agent was just kind of ribbing me up, but she tells me now, she's like, I saw what you were capable of. And you know who else saw that? Miss Lucille, Lucille Clifton. She told me she saw this moment. Wow in a vision. Wow. Wow. That's and I powerful. thought she was just saying something. She said, no, Ani, I have seen it. You are going to be more successful than your wildest dreams. And I was like, and when Miss Oprah called me, I sat on my couch and I cried and I talked to Miss Lucille's spirit. 
Oh, so on. many times you need people in your life to see things that you can't see. You know, I was trying to take the easy way out, Absolutely. but um, cause I'm tired now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but yeah. yeah. Your discussion of blues poetry was, was very interesting. And this is, can you repeat the three elements and give a, a bit of an explanation of them, please? So the three, there are actually seven elements to the blues. And if you want to know further, you can just Google my name and look up the blues poetic because I've written an essay about it. But there are three uh, movements, identification, Explore, exploration, resolution. So when you look at a, 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 that's the blues poetic. When you look at a blues song, it's a 12 bar lament. So it'll start out, right? So when you look at, for example, Langston Hughes, The Weary Blues, and, you know, and he'll talk about how he heard a Negro play. He heard a Negro play and then you know, it'll, it'll explore a little bit more and then it'll come back around, right? There's a trinity. I call the traditional spirituals the sacred blues. You will see that same three-part structure. If you also look at, because the, the great Sterling uh, A. Brown, when you look at Ma Rainey, right? And so he identifies when Ma Rainey comes to town, you know, and he starts doing that, right? And, and talking about all of these people, you know, um, from, from, you know, Cape Girardeau and Poplar Bluff comes to see Ma do her stuff. And then there's a, a middle section. And then the very end where she's, you know, she's this messianic figure testifying. And then at the very end, you know, people are sort of emotionally moved and it ends, there wasn't much more to fella say, she just get hold of us some mm -hmm. kind of way, right? So there's this trinity that happens. And there are also other elements. You have to have music, musicality, of course, it's the blues. You have to have a working class ethos to the blues because it starts with working class Southern people. It dips between major and minor chords, right? So there's all these, these sort of things um, that, that, that happens, but that, that trinity is very important to the blues. I'm gonna sneak in a question of mine uh, and it's very- Okay, it's Mr. Very Karen. I, I love at the beginning of the conversation when you talked about this novel is uh, of the black experience is not marginalized. I think that was so important, and I, I really would love for you to just talk a little bit more about that because you know we always talk about certain writers, black writers or um, writers of, of African descent or, or you know writers from the African diaspora being marginalized. And and you said this is this novel is not um, marginalized. Black the black experience is not not marginalized. Could you talk about that a little more, please? I sure can. I um, and I know people don't mean any harm, um, uh, non-black people. I mean, when they're asking me this question, but I had to sort of put it to rest once and for all, um, because I feel like Toni Morrison has already said this for us, um, and that is, you never ask white writers, and I'm not talking about you, Mr. Clarence. I'm talking about other folks. So don't think I'm getting snippy. People never ask white writers, why did you write this book about white people and never included? But people kept asking me, why did you feel it was important to write a, a novel about black uh, women? And finally I said, well, I'm black. <laughs> and, and I'm the center of my universe. Nobody ever, when you see a white man and he write about being out in the wilderness and he fighting bears and, you know, and, and trapping his own food and all of that, nobody says Jonathan Franzen or whoever, 
right? Because, you know, people are complaining that Jonathan Franson wasn't on that um, New York Times best of list, right? What if you only write about white men? Can you speak to that? No one, that, that sounds completely ridiculous because it is. But there's always this point where black people have to justify why we are writing about ourselves. And so one of the things that I feel is my mission, it's not a mission I wanted to take up. When I first wrote this book and this book first came out, you know, when this book first came out, I just wanted to talk about it as a family book or whatever. But this responsibility was thrust upon me, you know, as it were. And, it's, and, and so I have to either accept it or reject it. And I'm not going to reject it because the young folks coming up behind me need this. In the same way that Toni Morrison stood on that rock of righteousness alongside, you know, Alice Walker and several other people, that, you know, it's time for me to do that. You know, even though I'm in my 50s, I don't want to look at myself as an elder, but, you know, here it is. Um, so I think that continually talking about the fact that Black people are at the center of this country. We are the center of the founding of this country. That's one of the things that I found out when I was doing all of that research. So you have historians who have been, you know, doing that for all these years. But until recently, you know, until the 1619 Project, you didn't have any mainstream books that were, you know, really talking about this, right? So I think that it's incredibly important that we do that because there's this attitude that this is the white man's country. This is when you look at the founding fathers, which is, um, you know, a, a term that goes all the way back to um, not the founding fathers, but the fathers goes all the way back to Abraham Lincoln, you know, the Gettysburg Address, right? So you look at this, they're not talking about black men fathers, and I'm a radical feminist, so I'm, I'm totally against patriarchy, but they're not even including black men in patriarchy. It's all about white men. That's right. Mm -hmm. But we built this country. Okay, they stole the land from the Native Americans. And then we built all, all of these big, when you go down south, all of those courthouses and plantations, all of that was built by Black people. And so there's this sort of attitude um, that we have no, um, no dog in this American fight. And we even have black folks saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to Africa. Well, goodbye. <laughs> God bless you. Okay, send me some jollof rice from across <laughs> the water because I will be right here, okay? <laughs> So that is, I think, you know, one of the things that I want to continue to talk about is that we are at the center so that when people start to say, you know, why do you have all these black people, right? Because their attitude is the American story is the white person's story. That, that's what true American means. And, and so when you had, I mean, you had a few stupid Negroes with the insurrection on January the 6th, right? It's always three or four stupid Negroes up in there with, with some white folks. I don't understand what that was about, but whatever. But the majority of them were white men and they were like 1776. And this is, you know, so that's their thing. This is our country, right? So I'm offering not just a counter narrative, but a real narrative based upon years of historical research. And that's one of the reasons I did that because if you're just saying stuff and you don't have, you know, you get people who say, well, you know, I wrote about uh, slavery, but I just didn't want to complicate it with too much research. Okay, well, you know, 
How can you? <laughs> How can you write about it? Not complicated with research. I mean, research is what you're gonna. Well, you know, that's fine, but the from. ancestors will be, you know, tormenting me through my through <laughs> my sleep. Okay. I'm concerned about myself, you know. So, you know. I understand. I understand. We could go on, but we're we're nearing yeah. our time. I want to thank you, Honore, so much for joining us. And and, and again, congratulations on this fantastic book. And um I'm I'm halfway through. <laughs> 800, I'm halfway through. Take your time whenever oh, I, you, And that's why I keep taking time. my time. I read a little bit and I said, wow, I need to close my book and let this absorb this for a minute, you know, before I, I'm just going to flip pages. But I want to thank you so much. And again, to everyone, uh, please visit African American Literature Book Club, aalbc.com to purchase your copy of the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. I want to thank you, Dr. Green, for, for spearheading Center for Black Literature and, and keeping us motivated. Again, I want to thank the Center for Black Literature team. I want to thank you all for joining us. And if you enjoyed the program this evening, please visit our website, www.centerforblackliterature.org, and kindly make a donation. There's also a survey that's popped up on your screen. So we'd appreciate your filling out the surveys so we can uh, just give us some ideas about uh, your thoughts about the program. So that's very important. Again, I want to thank you all for joining us. I want everyone to have a healthy and safe and a happy holiday and uh, be well. And don't forget about the National Black Writers Conference that's coming up March the 30th through April 2nd of 2022. Have a happy new year and uh, be well and stay blessed. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. We love you. Bye, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, bye.